I'm going to speak a little bit about some things that I consider are a fundamental reality of AI and some things that um, we need to be careful about. So the first thing is you cannot innovate effectively without knowing new technologies like artificial intelligence. This may seem very obvious to those of us in tech, but sometimes we make a mistake. We start with the technology. The problems are what is more interesting in the world in which we live in. Now, in Asia, as you well know, there are five people that join the middle class every single second. And why do they join the middle class? For better health care, for better education, and also for better food. Yet, across the emerging markets, across the new frontier markets, or even markets like China, which are getting developed very fast, they are a big problem in food safety. There were 500,000 food safety violations in nine months in China two years ago. And since then, they have been actively trying to solve this problem. Now, I've taken the example of China, but really it could be anywhere. It could be Bangladesh, it could be Pakistan, it could be India, it could be Africa. How do you solve this problem? Now, imagine that you go to a second or third tier city in one of these countries and you want to cook some chicken. And you go to look for some chicken, you find it nicely wrapped in cellophane. Now, it's not your cold storage. It's not any of these places. And then you're looking at it, and you're wondering, is it really chicken? Now, it says that it's organic, it's healthy. But is it really organic and healthy? Were the chickens happily running around, or were they cooped up? This, by the way, is not a new problem. This is precisely the kind of problem for which there's a huge market, because moms like me would pay a little bit more for that assurance. But all of these grocery chains, all of these logistics suppliers, they couldn't figure out what to do. Till this fintech company called Zhang'an, which excels in micro-insurance, it teamed up with AI and IoT engineers and it said, we are going to put IoT sensors on the anklets of 23 million chickens so that we know if they're standing still in a cage or if they're running around. We're going to use facial recognition cameras uh, to know if whether they're the same chicken that they claim to be. Now, when I saw this idea, I thought it was a bit insane. But to be honest, the bigger problem that they solved was corruption. You see, you can take all the pictures you want, and you can put everything you want in a database. But in a corrupt country, as many countries in Asia and Africa are, somebody can go in and change that. So they decided they would put it on the blockchain. So that when you go and buy that meat, you are assured at every point that it's the same chicken. Now, this has been taken up by the Wall Street Journal, by Quartz Magazine. 100,000 chickens in China are wearing this device called Go Go Chicken. And they are tracking chickens. And they're using it in 2,500 farms. My point here is whether this becomes hugely scalable or not, this problem could not have been solved without deep techies at the table. There are things that we have done with satellite imagery and artificial intelligence that for years has plagued the insurance company and agriculture. This is a reality. But you don't do it for the sake of AI. You do it so that mothers can feed their kids with assurance. You solve a business problem, an emotional problem. I think that's really important. That's how you know whether the hype is relevant or not. 
Now, that was the first reality. The other reality is industries are completely reorganizing by AI capability. So you guys are very young. When I was uh, much younger, you know, it used to be that you went to banking, or you went to retail, or you went to manufacturing. And so all of us got our degrees in Boston, and we decided where we were going to go. But now people don't seem to care any longer. It's almost irrelevant. The reality is, how good are you at AI and data and other technologies? So I'm going to ask you a question. Why is a Norwegian telco buying a bank in Pakistan? If you look at the map, Norway and Pakistan are really far away. It seems there are a lot of paradoxical words here. Norway, Pakistan, telco, bank. Doesn't really make sense. But if you look at Pakistan, it has 206 million people. In 30 years, that's going to go up by another 150 million. And do you know how many people have a bank mortgage in Pakistan? You guess? 50,000. Can you believe that? That's such a huge opportunity. And yet the banks were very relaxed. They were making their money. They were earning it. They were not really bothered. So Telenor, because it was in Pakistan, it saw this problem. And it saw this problem not only in Pakistan, it understood that this problem is across Asia. In South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, 58% of the adult population has no access to financial services. Again, don't look at it as a statistics. Think about it. What if you couldn't get a loan? What if you didn't have a bank account? What if you couldn't pay for your child's doctor? You know, when you feel for your customer, then you can do something about it. They decided that, you know what? Look, just top up your telco card and just pay through it. They called it easy pesa, which means easy money. And now people could go without any bank account and they could pay for pharmaceuticals, they could pay for a Coca-Cola light. And after a little while, they started paying for the utility bills. And all this time, Telenor, from head office in Norway, was noticing that, yeah, it looks like we're kind of acting like a bank. There seems to be a need here. So maybe we should think about it further. And they did. They acquired the bank they were partnering with. And they gave this woman a loan. This woman is in Karachi. Karachi is a mega city, has over 10 million people. She's in inner Karachi. She wanted to start a beauty salon. Nobody would give her the loan. Why would you give her a loan? She's a housewife. You don't have any information about her. But Telenor did. Telenor knew how she was paying her utility bills. Telenor knew what she was buying. So Telenor gave her a small loan. And this use of alternative data is not new, right? Tala is a Silicon Valley company that can give somebody a loan in under 10 minutes on a mobile phone. And it judges this by whether they are browsing certain sites. How are they moving around? Are they their office or are they moving? Is their micro behavior aligning with their credit risk profile. Of course, we may feel people should not be allowed access to this data, but for these people it matters because they don't have access to any money. Anyway, I had dinner with Siv K, who's the CEO of Telenor, and he was surprised me because he was so innovative. He was not thinking as a telco at all. He was thinking, with this data and with AI, I can be anything I want. And sure enough, when Ant Financial 
decided to go to Pakistan, did they partner with the largest banks in Pakistan? No, they, they partnered with a Norwegian telco called Telenor. And this is the story happening again and again and again. This is the reality we live in. Not that AI is so cool and there's deep learning and reinforcement learning. That's not the point. It's that people have real problems. And if you address a real problem, then you can actually innovate with AI. And of course, Telenor then sold its Eastern European operations altogether and is now planning to merge with Akshayata in Malaysia. Now, if I just stopped there and walked off the stage, that would be really bad. Because then I would have left you with a whole lot of hype, with a little bit of reality. But that's not the way life works. With great power comes great responsibility. We know that the fake news crisis has been consistently a big problem. In the Indian elections, it was an issue on WhatsApp. And you see, WhatsApp is completely dark. You can't tell what people are talking to each other about. It's been an issue in multiple elections. And how did it all start? Because we all live in filter bubbles, and the algorithm keeps giving us things that we like. So if I like some racist or some misogynist, his post, it'll give me more posts like this, till I'll think that's my entire reality. That was not the intention of the people who put together Facebook or Twitter or others, but it has happened, and we must deal with it. I don't know how many of you know, but just a few weeks ago, an AI can create a fake UN speech in 13 hours. Basically, if you read it, if it came in your news feed, you'd think, yeah, this sounds like a like a UN speech, oh my god, they're attacking Iran, or whatever, you know? And then you may say, no, 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 Aisha. We are too smart for that. We know this fake news thing. I wouldn't believe it. OK. What if you heard it? You know, you could record my voice for just 3.7 seconds, and then you could make me say anything. You could take my Pakistani, American, Singaporean accent, and you could call my dad, you could call my clients, you could call my kids, and it would be very difficult for anyone to know it's not me. So what have you heard the Secretary General of the UN giving that speech? So the text is there, now the voice is there, and they're like, no, no, we have to see it, Aisha. Otherwise, we're not going to buy this. We are too smart for this. Well, we know that deep fake videos are the ultimate problem. This is President Obama. If you go and you look on Google, you say he's been made to say all kinds of things. Does this mean we should get rid of AI? Do you know where this comes from, this deep fake? When you do AI work, you encounter lack of data. It's a real problem. If I want to solve issues like cancer, I need more data. And so researchers with the best intentions started creating fake data. And this fake data was very helpful in solving some problems, but it also created this problem. And this is the way we need to now think of all technologies. Now let's do an exercise together. Apparently, MIT researchers very recently can kind of imagine your face based on you just speaking. So let's say I, you picked up a phone and you started speaking. The AI will draw a picture of you, and it's uncannily like realistic, kind of creepy. Now, let's think of this if this, how can it be good for humanity? How can it be bad for humanity? Well, here's the thing. You could say it's a great invention. You know what? 
There are so many missing children in the world. Children in slavery. Children who are missing. Their parents are so upset. If we could overhear chatter, we could recognize them. Wouldn't that be great? Then another person may come and say, yes, but what if the AI is biased and it flags me incorrectly at the border, the American border, as a potential terrorist and locks me up? Both things could happen. This is the reality of AI. Both things could happen. And there are pros and cons. Well, there you go. <laughs> The AI has rebelled. <laughs> I guess my point, sorry, uh, my point ultimately is that you need to know that both things can happen at any given time. And so we come to this new thing called AI governance. Everybody needs to understand that AI needs to be governed. Singapore government has set up an advisory council. It's one of the few in the world that's looking at safety. And it has just won an award for it at the United Nations. Because just complaining about it doesn't help, right? And as engineers, like at least data scientists, engineers like myself, we've never been taught to think this way. Nobody told us, Aisha, it either works or doesn't work. And now here's a third problem what could be its unintended consequences. You have to deal with it. And engineers are no longer back office like robots that you tell what to do. They have minds. We have minds. We have to stop and think. Now, people think it only happens in Europe, and it's true. Europeans are ahead in thinking about such things, which is great. I love going to Europe because I think I learn a lot about the emphasis on human rights. But Asia, with Singapore and now even China, is now thinking about thought leadership in AI governance. China has stopped certain fintech companies from doing exactly what I showed you, gathering data from phones. Because it says, we don't know, we don't trust you. We don't know what you're going to use it for. And for the first time, Beijing actually has a set of principles. Because everybody realizes that unfettered AI is not good for anybody. But the solution is not to stop it. It is to put governance measures all the time in place. And so for me, I think that is a correct approach to building AI-powered products. It either works, it doesn't work, and what may be its unintended consequences. I think this is a new thing. We must teach our children this. We must teach our engineers and data scientists this. And this is an inescapable reality. Also, the business people, you must probe the people who give you this. Too often, I come across people who think AI is smart. But it is only as smart as the people who designed it or the data we put in it, which means we must probe it for bias as well. So I just wanted to give you some things that I've learned, some mistakes, some lessons from spending the last, actually, 20 years since I did neural networks and AI, but especially two years since I've been running my firm in Asia and we built AI engines. So I hope that uh, you know, we can all continue the conversation and continue to make it human-centered, both in problem solving and in ethical design. Thank you.